Hey, Michael, welcome to the show as a way of getting started. Give us a little background on yourself. Hi, Brian. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so my name's Michael Galloway. Um, I'm not one of the guys that uh, shows up on your podcast and says that I've always wanted to be in sales. Uh, no. I'm an accidental <laughs> salesman. Yeah. Um, what yeah. happened? Rehab? <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. In, in a way, yes. Uh, my first career was in politics. Wow. Um, so, you know, coming out of school, I went to move to Washington, D.C. to change the world and went to work for my hometown congressman and ended up there 12 years. Uh, worked for three members of Congress, was the chief of staff to a member of Congress and a healthcare lobbyist and a hospital association executive. Uh, and then you know, the, the rehab part, right? It's, uh, you know, this isn't maybe exactly where I want to raise my family. It's maybe not exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life. And then you start looking around, what else is there for congressional staffer and lobbyists that's not in Washington, D.C.? Yeah. Uh, so you find your way to something else. And I've been very blessed that I found my way into sales. Well, I mean, politics is, it's a lot of selling, right? It's a lot of- A ton. Yeah. A ton. I think by definition, it's kind of either selling, communicating, hearing people out. Yeah. You know, you learn a lot of good lessons in politics that uh, that translate very well to enterprise sales. Yep. Um, you have a diverse constituency. Yes, you do. Uh, <laughs> people that want you there, people that don't want you there. And to be effective, uh, you have to be able to figure out a way to, to work with everybody. Um, and, you know, one thing I would say about politics specifically, but maybe my career in general, I started out, you know, working for a congressman and then I went to a lobbying firm and part of the lobbying firm was you had to be able to get your own clients. And when you talk about sales, right, that's, a, that's the business development side, you have to, to sell a client to hire you, yeah. but you, as a lobbyist, you don't actually sell anything. There's nothing tangible. You identify some pain, you attempt to put together a, a plan that's credible of how we're going to mitigate that pain for the client. And then you have to take that plan to the Congress and to the executive branch and sell them that it's a good idea and, and in the best interest of the country. Um, so it's a very intangible sale and it's, uh, it's difficult. Well, <clears throat> I would think that's kind of one of the hardest sales. Yeah. Right. Because it's, it, you can't really guarantee anything. Nothing, nothing. Now we're going to work as hard as we can work. And our clients have these success stories that we have, that we yeah. can tell you and we can give you the references and you can do your due diligence. But at the end of the day, it's politics. And sometimes they don't pass bills at all, right. much less your stuff didn't get into it. Uh, so it can be, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, but the risk rewards there, uh, when you're talking at scale, right. When you're talking about what it means to have legislation change a tariff or change this or that, uh, you know, it, it's worth swinging for the fences on the client side. And did you get good at that or was it just overwhelming and frustrating? You know, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd like to think that, uh, I certainly got better while I was doing it. Um, and you can talk about, uh, you talk about the lessons and, and how you get them. Some of them were expensive. Um, but, uh, yes, when I, when I finished, I was better than when I started. Yeah. Um, and I would say that now, uh, that in this current role, yeah, I, I think that's kind of incumbent on me to, to constantly be evolving and constantly be changing and constantly be modernizing the approach and making sure that it's appropriate for the right situations. Um, but what I would say that was very helpful to me in, in my DC time before I was truly, you know, a, a quota carrying rep, uh, which I am now, was I had the opportunity to switch sides of the table. And, and I know you've talked about this with other guests and, and have had the opportunity yourself, but when I was, when I started as a staffer, I didn't truly appreciate the lobbying role. I didn't understand exactly what they were thinking in our meetings. Yeah. And 
when I went to be a lobbyist, I was a better lobbyist because I'd been a staffer. And then I had the chance to go back and be a staffer. And I was a better staffer the second time than I was the first time, having been on the lobbying side of the table. And really, I think those lessons um, have helped lead me to where I am. The second time I went back, I went back as a chief of staff. So that's an executive position uh, where you're obviously not the member of Congress, but you're responsible for everything that happens on the political side and on the operational side of, of the congressional office. You know, Multi-state, decent sized budget, uh, obviously it's politics. So people are passionate about their positions. And a lot of times you have to be a, a, a calming influence. Um, but getting that executive experience, I, I moved into healthcare IT, which is where I am now, and, and went to the op side. Uh, I was on the operation, I was a VP, uh, executive, reported to the CEO, dealt a lot with healthcare IT vendors that were trying to, to sell to us, um, which I think helped me when I switched now into my current role back into sales. Yeah. Zigzagging back and forth, I think one of the things that helps this role be successful and also the operations role helps anyone be successful is to really be able to put yourself in the mind of who you're talking to. Yeah, <laughs> that's great experience. Now, help me understand like your personal motives because you're the first person I've ever interviewed that came from a political background. Yeah, so personal motives of why do you go to Washington, right? I mean, you're right well, out of school, you're, well, you're yeah, idealistic. Well, and Yeah, because that, that doesn't necessarily align with sales. It kind of is, it's intriguing, it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's very strategic. So, so there are a lot of corollaries you can draw there. Um, every time that you are trying to do something in politics, there's at least one, most many times, many people trying to keep you from doing it. Yes, I noticed okay. that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and 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 you think about uh, you think about politics maybe as a chessboard would be an analogy that makes sense. If I move this piece, they're going to move that piece. They don't know I've got this piece over here that I haven't used yet uh, previously. Um, you know, not a not an exact analogy, but it's very strategic. It's very much of action, reaction, and that translates very well to enterprise sales. Uh, that, that part no, I, I do get. So the, no so the, one, the mental challenge excites yeah, me. Yeah. yeah, it's the mental challenge of being able to map out, this is where we are, this is where we want to be, and then having the flexibility to not try to do it the same way every time. Yeah. Uh, but to have some guiding principles and things that maybe you've taken a misstep in the past that allows you to say, well, the last time I did it just like that, it went really badly for me. So I need to do something different, but let's, instead of doing it just like that, let's do it kind of like that. And right. Because certainly in the larger enterprise sales, it's very political. You know, people think Very. it's pure economics and logic. And it's like, no. no. <laughs> mm -mm. Mm -mm. And, you know, uh, we all know companies that operate in silos. Uh, and I think that's a challenge that, that literally every enterprise struggles with is how do we, how do we be cross siloed? How do we be cross matrixed? How do we set aside territory and turf and ego for the benefit of the organization and the, and the customer. Um, no one has that perfectly right. There are various degrees of how wrong it is. <laughs> well, you know, because you, you see the, you know, the shows like House of Cards or the Mafia shows, with, you know, because people don't ex expose their real interests. That's right. They expose what you they want you to see. Mm -hmm. That is a hundred percent, and and that is true in enterprise sales. Yes, it is <laughs> very much so. <laughs> and, and as reps, we're like, well, well, that makes it makes perfect business sense. Well, but no, it's going to affect someone's career, right? Do they care? Is yeah, is the risk the risk reward profile regardless of the economics? You know, if right. you're doing a major software implementation and it goes badly, 
that affects someone's career in a way that they may or may not be able to recover from. Um, regardless of the economics, if it goes well, the downside is can be bigger than the upside is great. And right, because if it goes so, well for the company, it doesn't mean it goes well for each person in the company. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, it's really interesting. I think uh, one of the things that I've been really working to get better, and, and again, I, I think that sales is a journey. Uh, I don't think you're ever there. I do think you can get better and better and better if you put the time in to do things like, I mean, I've gotten a lot better watching your pod. Uh, I've, I've, I, uh, I probably haven't gotten as much better in 2020 as I was in 2019 because you were my go-to download the pod on the airplane on my way to meetings and try to tease out a few nuggets that I could implement. Uh, hadn't, hadn't logged as many air miles in 2020 as I did in 2019. Um, so really I'm consuming your content probably more on LinkedIn right now. Um, but I think if you are dedicated to trying to be better and you're seeking out outside, outside resources, you're seeking out, you know, the brutal truth, you're reading the challenger sale, you're reading the trusted advisor, you're reading business strategy books to help you understand what maybe the other guy is thinking or because, you know, I think that uh, all of that really matters. And I think to the piece that has been really helpful for me is I'm continually getting better at actually qualifying leads. Um, and, and it's really given me a lot more time to work deals that have a chance to close and not chase deals that never had a chance to close. I just needed them or wanted them to close. And so I was viewing them through that lens. That's that, <laughs> that utilization of time is the difference between like the A player and the B player. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and they could easily just be as, they could easily have the same skills post qualification. They just don't have enough time to time. grind enough hours to right. get enough signatures. Yeah, because the time you, you can't get more of. No, no. And it's very precious. Um, it's also, I think I've become a lot more cognizant of time with a prospect is becoming more and more precious. Yes. In any form, yes. just getting them on the phone, on a Zoom, which is, you know, a little bit new. I, I, 2019, I did exactly zero video conferences. <laughs> <laughs> Never did one. Uh, if, if there was a meeting, I was getting on an airplane yep. and, and was happy to do it. You know, I'm sort of rethinking my strategy for, for this year um, and that I'm going to continually overqualify and try to do that remotely. And then once I feel comfortable that this is a prospect that meets my qualification criteria, and we can talk about that a little bit in a second, but uh, then I'll get on an airplane because I can have a lot of conversations from my desk like we're having right now. And I have to have some number of conversations before that turns into a contract. And being able to have 25 conversations in a week or five, um, is easier to do from my desk than it is to do from the skies or from a hotel. Yeah. And then I can, when I do start traveling and getting back in front of my clients and prospects, it's going to be a whole lot more efficient. I think it's, it's a good skill because it kind of forces you to become good at it. And there's nothing beats face to face, but if it's face to face with somebody who's not going to buy within your window, that's right. It's a that's very it. expensive not not from a money standpoint, but from time. That's right. You yes. know, I, I, I attempt to talk to a lot of people. Yeah. And very few of those people that I talk to are what I now consider to be a qualified prospect. Yeah. And, and you know, everybody's got some different criteria of, of how they qualify prospects. I think, you know, I've learned a lot on that from, from listening to you talk to people. Um, the big one for my business is they have to be able to tell me often I can walk into a room and know what their problems are and they don't know them. Yeah. Uh, me telling them that 
doesn't go very far. No. So we have to have a conversation and kind of guide them to a realization through me not talking and me asking a lot of questions. And then every time I finish talking, there's a question mark at the end. And, and that part, if I can lead them to understand that they may have a problem, that's step one. But if they can't quantify it, they're not going to spend any money to fix right. it. And, and they can quantify it qualitatively. That's not as good as quantitatively a lot of times, but I have to be able to have a discussion with them, not about how great the future state is going to be. We have to talk about how you can't live like this any longer because it's costing you in terms of an agreed upon something. Yes. And, and that brings up <laughs> this, what I'm finding is that a lot of people, you know, they have symptoms of problems, but they don't mm -hmm. want to really admit they have a problem. No, no. And they lie to you. They, they will actually tell you. Sometimes, right? Yeah. It, enterprise sales too, uh, Brian, I've gotten a lot better at that. Uh, I would say when I first started in enterprise sales, someone would call me or I'd have a conversation and they'd say, I have a problem. You do this. Can we do a demo? Can I have a proposal? And let's move forward. There were plenty of times where I said, sounds great. I've got a prospect. Let's put it in the pipeline. Yep. Close next month. Close next quarter. Um, it never works like that. When, when often when they tell me what their problem is, I use that as a springboard for a conversation. And very, very often they are not treating their problem. They're treating a symptom. And I'm leaving a lot of revenue for our company and value for the client on the table by not actively working with them to figure out exactly what their problem is. And if we're a good fit, great. I'd almost rather, not rather, but it's as important to me to know if we're not. Yep. Because uh, right. again, going back to the qualification, right? I've only got so much time. Yes. And, and if, their, if their real problem is not something that we are prepared to address well, it's going to be very, very difficult to win if I win it at all. And if we win it, the client's not going to be thrilled. Right, because I, I see those inbound ones where they're really trying to buy something that's going to fix a part of the problem. But then when yeah. they try and go and get money, someone's going to push back and go, can it wait? Can you buy less? Can you go right. do your due diligence? And yeah. the sales process starts all over again. And those generally don't end well in my experience. No. Uh, I, I think, you know, you, the sales process to me is a bit like a roller coaster. And once you're in it, you're in it and you're not getting off. Uh, <laughs> you're not getting off at the end early and starting over like you're, you're going. And, and from the buyer's perspective, they don't want to start over. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, man, I'd really like to have some in-depth conversations with some sales guys so I can come <laughs> up with some problems that I didn't know I had. Like, you, you've got to understand where they are. Um, and, and it's really important to understand both the organizational but also the personal goals. Yes. You know, if you're working with somebody in the business that's a VP and they are looking to elevate their stature in the company and maybe join the C-suite or have some successes under their belt they can point to when they work with a recruiter to move to a C-suite at another organization. That's a different sale for me than if I'm working with somebody who is measuring everything in terms of dollars and cents. Yeah. And you know, success is we get four times ROI or 40 times ROI and failure is we get three times or 30 times, right? That's a diff, I approach those very differently. And what other things have you learned along the way that you think the audience would gain value from? If they can't tell you how much their problem's costing, 
they will not spend money to fix it. Right. And the, yeah, that, because it, then it looks like when they go to get money or go to walk it through the process, someone's going to ask that. Yeah. In some yeah. form. They may not say sure. what the ROI is, but it's like, well, can't we do okay with what we have? Right. Is it a cheaper, easier solution? Can it wait sure. six months or a year? Of course. All the time. That's the default. People don't want to change. And they don't want to spend money. <laughs> no. No. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, this is money. I got to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I sometimes think some of the people at my house think that, but uh, no one in business. Get rid of uh, your money. Yeah. <laughs> so if they had to work for it, it's like. Uh, that's right. You know, the other thing that I think that people would need to know, there's a tendency, and I have done it, to where when you first get going, and boy, you're putting in all the research. I mean, you're pounding over everything from, you know, local chamber of commerce, economic stats to sell something to a hospital or a health system, which is what I do. And, you know, being really conversant in the economics of the local community and really tailoring what you're doing to them. And you have a little success and then you kind of stop doing it. Maybe you don't spend that last hour of prep Maybe you don't take that last note in the meeting or in the demo. And that's where you've got to do it. It's kind of non-negotiable. Uh, prospecting the same way. Nobody really likes to prospect and cold call and you know go to trade shows and try to strike up conversations in the cocktail hour. Um, but to be successful in a highly competitive sales environment, you have to be very detail oriented and do it the right way every single time. And I think it comes back to being ruthless with your time because, and that's the excuse everyone would give, right? Oh, I'm so busy with these other things that won't close that I didn't have time to do the thing to help this thing that could close. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, you, you can fly around and, and have a ton of meetings and be, leaving voicemails and, hey, you, did you get the proposal? <laughs> uh, and you can spend weeks just doing that. And you're no closer to selling anything than you are when you started. Yeah. And, and, and that's an easy trap to fall into. It's the natural trap. And it, it takes discipline to think through those deals. And reps have a hard time with that. How do you know if it's going to close? Well, it's right. judgment, right? Yeah, but but there's some questions you need to have the answers to, and yes. I don't think there's a, I don't think it's ironclad. I mean, we uh, hit on the on on the pain of not changing, right? So that's one yeah. uh, timeline, uh, organizational process to try to get out in front of where you're going to have hiccups. Does this does this one need to go to a board? Does this one? Do you have the spending authority? Who, who else in this organization has the ability to say no or to delay? Yeah. And you have to be out in front on that and be talking to those people. You don't, some of them you will never get to fully embrace the project and be a champion to push it through internally, but you have to at least get them comfortable that it's worth doing. Yeah. And, and, and I can see the, you know, the political background having, develop that skill anticipation uh being proactive and predicting what's going to happen and not getting locked into the emotional side of this is such a great idea right yeah no that that's very helpful yeah, um you because see, it, it is it's a lot of if then and it's right it's, if I say this, how are they going to respond? And as you spend more time developing your own skills and your own methodology, the patterns start to emerge. Yes. And, and you can get to the point of, you know what they're going to say when you ask them the question. And that feels a whole lot better and allows for a lot more success than not knowing and not being prepared for the answer. 
Well, I think, yeah, if you don't have that curiosity and interest and empathy mm -hmm. and say, okay, if I ask this, what are they going to say most likely? And then right. if they say that, how do I build off of that and not just crumble? Yeah, either way, right? Sometimes you ask a question, there, there are four answers. Don't have budget, too many competing priorities. You know, you have to know what you're, how you're going to ask the next question, not tell them what's the next question you're going to ask after that to guide them to a place that you want them to be. And yeah, because that's it. And those people call those objections, but they're really excuses. Sure. It, it typically means that you didn't build up any curiosity and interest. That's right. And you're moving too that's fast. Right. A hundred percent. So, you know, you asked me earlier and, I, and we got into it a little bit about what if someone was going to be in enterprise sales today, there is no detail that's not important. And you, the rep, don't have the objectivity going in to determine what's important and what's not important. So treat them all like they're very important. And, you know, I lost I lost my first enterprise deal on that lesson. And, and learned it uh, since then. Um, you know, I had a room full of people. I had a great relationship with the decision maker, the, the guy who controlled the budget. Uh, we demoed to the team. There were a couple of questions about features and functions for the software solution. Yes, we have it, here it is. Everything was great. We go into reference. And uh, I didn't coach my reference on one, what I consider to be very minor feature that the reference didn't even use. Mm -hmm. And that, that lost the deal for me. There was, there was someone on the team. They said, uh, tell me about how this works. And the reference says, I don't even know if they have it. We, 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 don't, we don't use that. Now I didn't get a call back saying, you said that you had this and then the reference said, no, they just signed a contract with somebody else, right? Okay. And uh, and in the debrief, you know, the post-mortem, that's a very minor feature in a seven-figure software solution uh, that other clients didn't even have turned on and didn't know it existed. They saw so little value in it. Yeah. I discounted it, but my client didn't. Right. And I lost the deal. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I always had this saying, and I, I tell either the reps or my engineer, I go, I've never over-prepared for a meeting. You're right. Where you, you come out, of certainly a first call, mm -hmm. where you go in and it's like, do I have an unfair advantage in this meeting? Do I know something that I know is going to light their fire? Yeah. And have I thought through, you know, what they're going to say, you know, the delays. And I, I used to have a manager who his mode was like, let's just go in and see what happens. And it's like, you know, does any uh, sports player just, you know, roll out of bed and see yeah, what happens? No film prep. No, uh, we'll see who I'm guarding tonight. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, there's like the, the Tiger Woods documentary on HBO right now. And you just watch this guy practice. Here he is, the best of the best. And he just practices and set. he knows how to hit a golf ball. Yes. But, but he knows the distinctions are so minor. And it's the difference between you know, in, in sales. And I've, I've heard you say it. I mean, there's no commission for coming in second. There's none. You, you win you did all the work or you lose. You did all that work. And, and, you know, from the corporate perspective, your company didn't benefit your customers, your, your coworkers that, you know, that they didn't increase revenue this year. Well, uh, and yeah. it's hard. It's hard to consistently track every one of those details. It's really easy to, to think in an enterprise sale that uh, the meeting with IT is just perfunctory uh, because they can't sign the contract, right? Uh, but well, IT can say no. 
you know, they may not be able to say yes, but IT's killed a lot of deals for a lot of reps because they felt like they weren't, their concerns weren't being understood. That's I'm going through this exercise right now. We're doing a lot of sales kickoff talks. And, you know, the first step is we have a Zoom call, typically CEO, CRO, VP of marketing. And I'm trying to get to the problem they want to solve in my presentation. Yeah. And without a doubt, they all say, we really don't have a sales problem, Brian. We just want somebody to come in and they don't know what they want me to do. And mm -hmm. I go, well, you're not going to pay money for me just to entertain people. Right. You can get the, you can get the parody videos. Uh, I'll right, send you the I'm not YouTube the cheapest <laughs> and I'm probably not the most entertaining. So I'm not going to get the deal unless I find a problem. And I yeah. go, I, the first thing I say is like, so let's talk through your sales process. And, and I, I try and do it from backwards forwards, you know, okay. Like last quarter, how many of the things that forecast closed and they're all well under 50%. Sure. So that means, sure. I don't know if somebody cut your income in half, would that be an income problem? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and people, the, the call and, just starts the, to roll after that. <laughs> yeah, of course. And, and, and the forecasts, forecasts are never going to be totally accurate. They're forecasts for a reason, right. but if they're works. qualified well, then it's more than throwing darts. Well, and, the, the amount of effort that went to get it to the point where it was forecastable. Right. Big. Huge. Big. And you're never so going to let me ask hundred. you. Go ahead. Yeah, what, I mean, kind of, I got a quick question for you, if you don't mind. And you, you spend a lot of time railing against the evils of the CRM and the, the, the management by activity count and, and Mr. Pepperoni and, and some, <laughs> other, <laughs> some other great content. What are you seeing when you work with businesses and organizations? Because, you know, put on that ha the same hat, you know, if, if I'm our president and sales aren't where they want them to be, and I'm probably gonna look at a, the data I have to try to draw, to try to tease out some insights, right? Um, yeah. Now, if that's, if I know as the rep, that's the data that the executives are gonna look at, then I'm gonna make sure that data doesn't look like I'm not doing my job. But, so when you're working with maybe not as much sales leaders, but but C-suite executives and maybe chief revenue officers, maybe VPs or, or sales, how, how do you work with them on how to use the CRM as a tool to amplify your sales force as opposed to maybe an anchor that's holding it back? I, I think the, the first thing is you do not talk about what's in the CRM. You, you talk about what they're running into because you, you, you get the, the exact observer effect in your case. If, if mm -hmm. I say, oh, you, you only made 50 calls, that's why you're not making your number. They will touch the, the, the dial button 50 times every day. But sales goes down then because they're touching the button instead of thinking about how to close a deal. Right. And thinking is not a, it, there's no field for thinking in our CR. I can tell you, and I've never worked anywhere. There. And a lot of people think that thinking doesn't come without effort. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Thinking is effort. Yes. So I, I take them through. Okay. So there's the problem today we have is there's this pile of stuff in the CRM or in, on the internet that you can spend your time on. How do you develop that judgment skill to prioritize that? And who's most likely to have the problem that we solve? Mm-hmm. And, and really dig into what is working and focus double down on that because the activity is taking people away from what is working to work sure. on what isn't going to close. That's right. Yeah. There's an opportunity that, that, you know, maybe now I know uh, after some years of pain, I know this one's not really going to close. It's a, you know, it's a level one, it's a prospect. It's, I'm not even saying it's qualified, but uh, 
you know, how, how many times do you need to call into that account and leave a voicemail with no response um, versus going to spend your time on something else? And I think that nuance has in an American sales and American industry is lost. It is because what ended up happening was when the CRM came out and then the books were written by people in the tornado, where there was brand recognition, demand, and unfair advantage with their product. Mm -hmm. And activity was 80% of winning in that space. Uh -huh. But if you're in no brand recognition, no problem understanding, and... <laughs> They don't know who you are and they don't even realize the problem is something they care about yet. Right. Activity is 20% and skill is 80%. Right. And, and people don't want to admit that. They just think that activity will solve all problems. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you're running in the wrong direction, you're never going to get to the other place. So how, how, how well do you think that that lesson is received? Uh, I realize the delivery is very nuanced and takes skill, yeah. but it's you know, typically you... not received well because it takes work mm -hmm. and in people, it's so much easier just to yell than it is to help. Sure. And yeah, but, but I've done 12 startups in my life <laughs> and you know, I think one, we had some kind of brand recognition, had some kind of inbound. Most of them, it was really hard. And yeah. I, I was not, I didn't want to work 100 hours a week. I wanted to work 60 or 70 and make a lot of money. Right. <laughs> so I focused on what I call Sophie's Choice. Okay. Both of these deals look okay. But if I only had could pick one, which one would I pick? Right. You know, the old saying, if you chase two rabbits, you catch no rabbits. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, I mean, it, I think this is wrapping, wrapping back to where we started the call. It, yeah. you know, to be successful in sales and to be efficient in sales, you are the resource. And you can't just always work harder. If you want to make more money and you work in 15, 16 hours a day consistently, you're not seeing your family. What, why are you making the money? Uh, you, you know, you can't even use it. You're the, exhausted. The natural thing is you're chasing too many rabbits. Yeah. So, you know, really focusing on if I wanted to learn, if I was talking to a college, a young lady in college, and she came up to me and she said, Michael, I really want to be in sales. And I've had a few of those. I'm, I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Alabama. I teach a class a semester remotely. And, you know, occasionally I'll, I'll get into a discussion with somebody. How do I get into sales? And, you know, they're, they're, go Google it. Everybody's looking for salespeople because there aren't enough really good ones. There, there are a lot of warm bodies that have people 15, eight month stops. Uh, but there aren't a lot of really needle moving difference making salespeople out there. And to, for you to be one of those, you have to learn how to listen at a level that you've never listened before. You have to be detail oriented at a level that you have not been before in this format. It, it's detail oriented in a way that's not detail oriented, like a math problem or building an Excel sheet or a pivot yeah. table. You have to be detail oriented to that. This is detail oriented in a way that people generally aren't detail oriented. And, and, and you never get there. You always get better. But to be able to end every sentence with a question and while the other person is talking, you're recording what you're hearing and not thinking about what you want to say to it. That is a learned skill. That's yes. not, it's not innate in human beings. No. no and, 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 and you have to be really deliberate in the way you go about your business to get it. Yes. And so that's what I tell people. I mean, 
you think that in sales, you're going to show up, you're going to tell everybody how great your stuff is, you're going to ask them what they want to buy, and they're going to say, give me a proposal, let's move. That's how people that start in sales think. It's how I started in sales. I mean, that's what I thought. Right. And, and the problem is that I think there's a few companies out there that that can work, but it's not the rest. The vast ocean of right. people are selling things that other people don't know what they do, why they need it. Sure. And it's particularly enterprise. Absolutely. Yeah. If you want to sell big deals and you want to generate big value for your clients and then be compensated appropriate to the value you're generating, you have to be sophisticated in the way you go about your business. And you have to do it in a way that's not just innately natural to being a human being like everyone else. Mm -hmm. And so what I would, you know, I tell people, I, I tell people to subscribe to your podcast. I think you do a great job of that's teasing true. insights out of people that, you know, they're, they're not necessarily common sense, right. um, but they make sense when you hear it. And if you're deliberate about how you're consuming, how I, I'm deliberate about how I consume a lot of your content. Yeah. Uh, and we've got to take a little note and I'll say, you know what? I need to stop doing that. And I need to start doing this. And I've learned a lot from your guests and I've learned a lot from you, but you have to, if you want to be successful in sales, you have to want to be successful in sales. Yes. And you are the only person that's really going to make that happen. Yeah, you may have a manager that can coach you and, and give you some really good feedback. And I'm blessed to have one of those now. Um, but that can't be the only place you're learning. Yeah. Your manager's got a team of reps. Your manager's got an executive level that they're, she's interacting with. She's coaching a bunch of reps. You got to take control of it for yourself. Yeah. Cool. Hey, Michael, I really enjoyed this conversation. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Yeah, uh, on LinkedIn, Michael Galloway. Um, and, uh, you know, love to, anybody has any questions, hit me up there.